Welcome to today's webinar on completeness check of rich registration dossiers. My name is Henry Honkalammi, and I work in the data validation and completeness team here at ECHA. In today's webinar, we will give you an overview of the completeness check process and explain how the checks will be amended in May 2023. You will get advice on how the amended rules will impact you as a registrant and how you can start preparing for the changes before May. You can also use this opportunity to get answers to your questions in a Q&A panel. Our experts will reply to your questions in a Q&A panel. So if you're watching this webinar on 8th of February, you can send your questions to us from 11 to 1 Helsinki time by visiting the website slido.com and entering the code. You can also access Slido from the webinar page on the ECHA website. Please note that we cannot answer questions related to specific submissions. You can send those to us by using the contact form. Please also remember that when using the Slido, you should not send us any confidential information. We expect several questions throughout the webinar, and we may not be able to answer them all. So if your question is not answered by the time the Q&A session ends, you can still send it to us using the contact form. As always, the webinar material, video recording, and the Q&A summary will be published on the ECHA website. However, note that the Q&A summary may take a couple of weeks to appear. Now let's quickly go through the agenda for today's webinar. First, my colleague Veneta will give you an overview of the completeness check process and explain the background to the amendments that will take place in May. Then Jordan explains what changes are taking place in the substance identification rules. Christian will present how the completeness check of annexes 7 to 11 information requirements will be revised. And Mila will cover what changes in the completeness check rules of the use description. Finally, I will conclude the webinar with some take home messages. We are now ready to start with the first presentation. Hello, and welcome to this webinar on my behalf as well. My name is Veneta Nieminen, and I work in Unit A4 Data Availability at the European Chemicals Agency. My presentation we will give an overview of the completeness check process. I will explain how the automated and manual parts of the completeness check work and what are the different outcomes and their consequences. Furthermore, I will also give some background to the upcoming amendments to the completeness check, which will enter into force in May 2023. Before we move to the completeness check process, we will have a quick look at the overall submission pipeline, which you see on this slide. This will help you to understand at which stage the completeness check applies. As the first part of the process, the registrant prepare their dossier in Euclid. They can validate it before submission and correct possible issues by using the validation assistant. As the second step, the dossier is uploaded in ReachIT and submitted to ECHA. In ReachIT, the dossier goes through the completeness check. The completeness check includes both automatic and manual checks to verify that the data required by REACH is provided inside the dossier. If there are no issues with the dossier completeness and the invoice is paid, the registration is accepted and the registration number is granted. Later on in the process, evaluation of the submission data by ECHA or member states are possible. Now, let us have a closer look at the completeness check process. The completeness check ensures that all the required elements are in the registration dossier as per Article 20 of the REACH legislation. The completeness check is performed on each registration dossier submitted to ECHA, regardless if the dossier is initial or an updated submission. All the information in the dossier is checked, whether it's newly submitted or already part of a previous submission. The completeness check can only be successful if all the information in the dossier is complete. Due to manual checks, the process can take up to three weeks before the registrant receives the outcome of its submission. 
Most of the completeness check consists of automated rules that are displayed by the Euclid Validation Assistant. The Validation Assistant is a tool which is available in Euclid, and the main purpose of it is to assist the users in the preparation of the dossier. Therefore, we strongly recommend to use the Validation Assistant before you create and submit the final dossier to ECA. The Validation Assistant report will list all the automated rules for which the validation failed and will help you to minimize any unnecessary failures and potential rejection of your submission. Make sure that you have downloaded the latest Euclid version from the Euclid website before preparing and validating your dossier. Only the latest version of Euclid will allow you to identify all the completeness issues that you might have in your dossier. If you want to learn more about the Validation Assistant and how to use it, you can check our tutorial how to run the Validation Assistant, which is available in YouTube. Furthermore, you can also find a list of all the automated completeness check rules in Annex 2 of the manual, How to Prepare Registration and P-Port Dossiers on the ECA website. However, please be aware if the Validation Assistant does not indicate any failures, this is not an automatic confirmation that your dossier is complete. Since the manual verification done by ECA staff are not displayed in the Validation Assistant report, and this brings us to the next topic of manual checks. Since 2016, completeness check also includes manual verification, which means that ECA checks certain elements of the registration dossier that cannot be checked automatically. The outcome of the manual verification cannot be predicted by the Euclid Validation Assistant. ECA performs a manual verification on both new registration and update of existing registrations. The manual verification does not assess the quality of the information, but only ensures that the required data is provided in the Euclid dossier and the dossier is complete accordingly. If you want to learn more of the manual checks, which ECA staff is performing, please visit the link which is included on this slide. Now we will take a closer look at the different completeness check outcomes. During the first completeness check stage, if the dossier passes the completeness check, this will result in a positive outcome. For initial registration, this means that the registration number is issued. Positive outcome for a registration update means that the updated information will be included in ECAS database. The outcome of the first completeness check stage could also be negative, and this means that the registration has failed the completeness check. In that case, you are granted four months to update the dossier and resubmit it to ECA. You will receive a letter in your Reach IT task listing the incomplete information and specifying the deadline for the new submission. It is really important at this stage to carefully follow the advice in the letter in order to successfully submit the update by the requested deadline, as you only have one possibility to submit a complete dossier after failing the completeness check. When the requested update is submitted, the dossier is checked again for its completeness. If the updated dossier passes the second completeness check, the submission will be accepted. For initial registration, it means that the registration number will be granted, and for a registration update, it means that the information will be updated at ECAS database. However, if the second submission is still incomplete or you fail to resubmit your dossier by the completeness check deadline, your submission will be rejected. Rejection of initial submission means that the registration number will not be granted. And if there were any fees involved, then the fees will also not be refunded. If the submission was an update of an existing registration, you will keep the registration number, but the updated information will not be accepted in ECAS database. That also means that the information will be not available for subsequent processes, such as compliance check, for example. The rejection process might take up to two months to be finalized. While the process is ongoing, new submissions are not accepted in Reach IT for the same substance by the same registrant. In the end of the decision-making process, you will receive a notification to your Reach IT tasks of a new decision. 
The decision letter will explain why your registration is rejected. With this slide, we conclude the completeness check process overview and we'll move to the next topic. The rest of the webinar will focus on the amendments to the completeness check in 2023. On this slide, you will see the main triggers for the completeness check amendments. The main reasons behind the amendments is that the REACH annexes were revised in 2022 in order to improve the clarity of certain legal provisions. The changes took effect on 8th of January and 14th of October 2022. The information requirements concerning aquatic toxicity and degradation endpoints were also clarified in recent ECA Board of Appeal decision. And furthermore, ECA has also identified certain shortcomings in the use descriptions provided in existing registrations, which we aim to improve with the updated completeness check rules. The amend and new completeness check rules will be implemented in May 2023. Most of the completeness checks rules will be visible and there will be automated rules and therefore visible in Euclid Validation Assistant as of the next Euclid release, which will enter into force in the end of April. We recommend that you start preparing for the changes already now. The next presentations in this webinar will explain in more details how the completeness check rules will change and how you can amend the information in your dossier. Thank you for the attention. And now I'll give the floor to my colleague, Jordan, who will introduce the topic of the substance identification. Hi, I'm Jordan Essen from the Data Validation and Completeness team. In the following section, we will look at what has changed regarding the completeness check of substance identification, in particular, some new rules for boundary compositions. The completeness check of substance identification will be changed by adding new rules for boundary compositions reporting sections 1.2 of the Euclid dossier. These rules aim to improve the consistency of the information reported in the boundary composition and cover four main areas. The state form field, compositional information, molecular and structural information, and additives. Before we take a closer look at the new rules, let me first explain the concept of boundary composition. So, boundary compositions have been required for lead dossiers since 2016, as they define the boundaries of the substance and what can be covered by the joint submission. As such, they are the link between the registered substance and Annex to 7 to, 7 to 11 data, as well as classification and labelling data, and Persistence, Bioaccumulation and Toxicity Assessment, or PBT. Since 2016, compositions must be reported in the lead registrant's dossier and are subject to certain business rule checks to verify that the minimum information is present. The information provided in the boundary composition is extracted to the REACH IT joint submission page and displayed to participants of the joint submission. New checks can be viewed as building upon the current checks with the aim of standardising and improving the information provided in boundary compositions. We will now look at each of the areas where the new checks will apply, starting with the new checks which ensure that a state or form is provided for boundary compositions. As shown on the screen, this field takes the form of a drop-down list from which the selection should be made, or if none of the selections fit well, you can select other and provide your own state or form in the free text field that appears. In case your composition covers nanoforms, you must select the value solid nanoform in order to be able to insert their characterization parameters. The state form of the or state or form of the boundary composition will then be extracted to the REACH IT joint submission page to make it visible for the members of the joint submission. Next, we will look at the new rules regarding constituents, starting with monoconstituent substances. For such substances, we expect to find only one constituent reported, and that this constituent is the same as the reference substance reported in section 1.1. Any deviation from reporting only one constituent must be justified clearly in the justification for deviations field. For multi-constituent substances, the new rules will check that more than one constituent is present and that none of the constituents 
match the reference substance in section 1.1. Similar to before, any deviations from reporting more than one composition must clearly be justified in the justification for deviations field. For the final substance type of UVCBs, the rules check that there is more than one constituent. Again, deviating from this rule by reporting only one constituent or one combined group of constituents must be justified in the justification for deviations field. Substances should be characterized as far as possible based on the information that you have available. For all substance types, at least molecular formula and molecular weight must be provided. Also, for monoconstituent and multi-constituent substances, a structural formula must be provided. For a UVCB substance only, if the molecular formula or molecular weight can't be provided, an explanation why must be provided in the remarks field. Continuing the new rules covering the boundary compositions, we now look at additives. For every additive present, the function must be defined from the pick list. Only sections beginning with the word stabilizer are applicable under REACH and CLP regulations as shown in the picture. As was true for constituents, for additives we require the molecular formula, molecular weight and structural formula be provided. If this is not possible, then an explanation must be provided in the remarks field. Finally, we have some take-home messages for you to remember today. The new rules on boundary compositions will be applicable to lead registration dossiers only. If you are a member registrant, you are not expected to report a boundary composition in your dossier. All the requirements that we have presented can already be reported in the current Euclid release, as all the necessary fields are already there. More details on everything covered can be found in the Guidance of Identification and Naming of Substances under REACH and CLP, which can be found at the link on this slide. This concludes the substance identification part of the webinar. Next up will be Christian, who will explain some changes in the technical completeness check for Annexes 7 through 11. Hi, my name is Christian Caramida and I work in the completeness check team at the European Chemicals Agency. Today I'm going to present you some of the most impactful changes that we will introduce in the technical completeness check of Annexes 7 to 11 as of May 2023. Here is the agenda for today. First topic is about examples of updates made over the Euclid formats in different sections. Secondly, a few details about the improvements that we brought in the mutagenicity endpoints. Then, we will talk about the improvements for reporting the weight of evidence approach. And lastly, I will present the impact of two ECA Board of Appeal decisions related to the long-term aquatic toxicity and degradation endpoints. The review of REACH Annexes 7 to 11 brought many updates of the Column 2 provisions. Therefore, the standard phrases available in the field justification for data waiving are now improved to be in line with the revised legal text. We recommend that whenever it is possible, and if applicable for your substance, you would use a standard phrase. This way, you will make sure that your justification for waiving is already one of those provided by the column 2 of REACH Annexes. If none of the standard phrases is applicable for your substance, then you can select the option Other and provide your arguments in the related free text field. There are different ways in which the standard phrases were impacted by the new format updates. In the first screenshot, you can see an example of a new standard phrase option in section 421, dissociation constant where the study does not need to be conducted because the substance does not have any chemical group that can dissociate. In the second screenshot, an example of an updated standard phrase is displayed. It reflects an improved justification related to the classification of the substance for the endpoint toxicity to reproduction. The updated part is highlighted in yellow.
If none of the existing standard phrases are applicable to your substance, you can select the option Other and then provide your justification in the following free text field. Make sure that you describe all the, arg all the arguments based on which the standard information requirement can be waived. This justification is manually verified by the ECA staff in the completeness check. Another type of improvement relates to the conditional standard phrases. This type of phrases require additional action in the same or in a different section of the Euclid dataset. For instance, if in section 4.8, water solubility, the standard phrase related to the substance being a metal or sparingly soluble metal compound is used, then you are expected to provide in the same section 4.8 an endpoint study record for the transformation dissolution of metals and inorganic metal compounds. On the same line, if the in vitro gene mutation study in mammalian cells is waived based on the argument that the substance is known as germ cell mutagenic and carcinogenic, then you must make sure that appropriate selections are made in section 2.1 of your dataset. These conditional checks are sustained by completeness check rules that are visible in the validation assistant report. Some of the standard information requirements have been slightly renamed. These updates are now reflected in the endpoint field selections. For example, the former surface tension is now renamed as surface tension of an aqua solution. The studies required under section 842 of REACH Annex 8 are no longer called in vitro cytogenicity studies. Euclid section 6.3.2 refers now to toxicity to soil arthropods instead of terrestrial arthropods. The endpoint name of existing records will be automatically updated and so most likely no action will be needed from your side. Let's move on to the next topic, mutagenicity. The reviewed rich annexes are now more detailed for the mutagenicity endpoints. A more predictable, predictable sequence of the expected information is possible already from the Annex 7 requirements. For example, there are now clear instructions when the follow-up steps in case of in vitro gene mutation study in bacteria is not applicable for the substance or if it gives positive or ambiguous results. New completeness check rules will guide you with addressing all the required endpoints, depending on the reported results. For example, in case the standard Annex 7 requirement in vitro gene mutation study in bacteria is not applicable for your substance, you are expected to provide a justification on why the study is not applicable, and at the same time, provide an Annex 8, Section 843, in vitro gene mutation study in mammalian cells record. Depending on the applicability or the results of the in vitro gene mutation study in bacteria or in vitro gene mutation study in mammalian cells, you may be required to provide an Annex 9 in vivo mammalian somatic cell study or testing proposal together with an Annex 8, Section 842 study for in vitro chromosome aberration study in mammalian cells or in, vi in vitro micronucleus study in mammalian cells. At Annex 8 level, the studies under REACH Sections 842 and 843 are standard information requirements. If any of these studies are not applicable for your substance, or if positive results are reported, then you are expected to provide or propose an appropriate in vivo mammalian somatic cell study.
Let's go through some examples on how the mutagenicity endpoints must be reported and follow up, followed up depending on their applicability or results. If a positive result is obtained in an in vitro gene mutation study in bacteria, then the follow-up step is to provide an in vitro chromosome aberration study or in vitro micronucleus study according to, action, to Annex 8, Section 842. Next, an appropriate in vivo mammalian somatic cell or testing proposal is expected, depending on the results of the 842 study. If, on the other hand, an in vitro gene mutation study in bacteria is not applicable for your substance, then you are expected to first select standard phrase in the justification, justification for data waving field. In the field justification for type of information, you must elaborate on why the study is not applicable. The next step is to provide Annex 8, Section 843 study for the in vitro gene mutation in mammalian cells. If the in vitro gene mutation study in mammalian cells gives a positive result, you are expected to provide an in vitro chromosome aberration study or in vitro micronucleus study according to Annex 8, Section 842, and also to provide if available, or propose an appropriate in vivo mammalian somatic cell study. At Annex 8 level, if any of the in vitro studies provides a positive result, you are expected to provide or propose an appropriate in vivo mammalian somatic cell study. However, if any of these studies is not applicable to your substance, Remember that you must also address the inapplicability of the study with a standard phrase and a justification. As you may see, the testing requirements have not changed. The requirements have been already available in the ECA guidance documents. The revised legal text aims to better clarify the requirements and this way, we hope that the new completeness check rules will support you with the sequence required by the legal text. The next topic on the agenda is Annex 11, Section 1.2, Weight of Evidence. Whenever the weight of evidence approach is used, it must be scientifically justified. For this reason, we are now providing a new structured way to provide this justification in a document marked as Weight of Evidence Justification and Conclusion. This type of record will be required whenever new documents with the adequacy of study marked as Weight of Evidence are added into the registration dossiers. However, Please note that no action is currently required for the old datasets containing weight of evidence documents. All the applicable weight of evidence source documents must be linked to the new justification document. To provide a weight of evidence justification, you must create a new document for the respective endpoint in Euclid and in the field type of information, you must select the value weight of evidence justification and conclusion. In the field justification for type of information, select the weight of evidence justification template. This template will guide you through the expected areas that your justification must address. In the cross-reference table, make sure that you link all the weight of evidence sources that, con that contribute to your approach. The weight of evidence sources must be information of good reliability. Lastly, 
make sure that you summarize the conclusion of your weight of evidence approach in the results and discussion table. This field together with all those mentioned on the previous slides are checked with automated completeness check rules. In dossiers where new weight of evidence documents are added. Now, the last topic of my presentation refers to the possibilities for waiving the long-term aquatic toxicity studies and the degradation studies. There were two ECA Board of Appeal decisions that impacted the interpretation of the Column 2 provisions of these requirements under Annex 9. In these decisions, the ECA Board of Appeal clarified that the results of the chemical safety assessment do not allow to omit information required under Column 1. Instead, it is a trigger for further data to be generated beyond the standard information requirements if the chemical safety assessment indicates such a need. As of May 2023, the outcome of the chemical safety assessment will no longer be considered as a valid data waiving justification for the Euclid sections 522, 523, 612, and 614. Therefore, the quotation of column 2 provisions referring to the outcome of the chemical safety assessment for these sections will be considered as an incomplete justification for waiving the standard information requirements. I will now leave you with a few take-home messages. First, make sure to review your existing data on mutagenicity, long-term aquatic toxicity, and degradation data waivers. Then make sure to use the improved Euclid formats for the new weight of evidence documents added to your dataset. And please use the new standard phrases, mainly the justifications for data waiving. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Mila Marinovic and I work in the Data Validation and Completeness team at ECA. In this section of the webinar, I will explain the upcoming changes in use description. Let's start with the overview. Shortcomings in use description have been identified by ECA that interfere with understanding of the use pattern of the substance. This led to the new and updated automated completeness check rules, which I will explain in more details here. The new rule applies to the product category, which makes one of the key elements in the use pattern information. Updated rule concerns the service life of the substance, which must be reported whenever environmental release categories ERC 8C and 8F are used. These changes are foreseen to improve the identification or prioritization of substances for regulatory action by making their use pattern clearer. Now let's go into more details on changes related to the product category. Field product category used becomes mandatory for uses reported in sections 353, uses at industrial sites, and 354, widespread uses by professional workers. And this applies to all the substances, except for intermediates, which are exempted. Thus, product category used field can remain empty. Product category describes the type of chemical products, substances as such, or in mixtures, in which the substance is finally contained. Some examples are paints, fuels, laboratory chemicals, etc. As mentioned already, PCs are one of the key elements in the use description, but PCs are currently missing for approximately 50% of uses in Euclid sections 353 and 354. For further information on the application of PCs, you can refer to the chapter R12 use description of the Guidance on Information Requirements and Chemical Safety Assessment, 
Appendix R 12.4. Now I will demonstrate how product category should be reported in Euclid. Here is an, an example of industrial use, which is reported under section 353 of Euclid, uses at industrial sites. Once the contributing activities for the environment and workers are filled in in the use record, you should choose an appropriate PC descriptor from the pick list under field product category used, which is marked here in yellow. As already stated, intermediates are exempted. So when you are reporting uses as intermediates in Euclid section 353, product category is not required because no adequate PC exists in case of intermediate. However, you still need to indicate the intermediate status in the field registration or notification status for the use, marked here in yellow. Moving on to the changes related to article service life. In 2020, ECA introduced new rules on service life as it was identified that service life uses were often not reported in dossiers. As of May 2020, a service life use has been mandatory if the dossier contains any industrial uses described with ERC 5, use leading to inclusion into or onto an article. ECA will now extend this rule also to ERCs 8C and 8F, as they also lead to an inclusion into or onto an article. In conclusion, a service life use record is required in Euclid section 356 whenever the preceding uses are described with any of the following environmental release categories, ERC 8C, 8F, and ERC 5. Service life describes the use of the substance in an article. Examples are dyes in textile articles, plasticizers in articles made from soft plastic material, flame retardants in plastic articles or pigments in dried coating after application in or on the article. For more information on article service life, you can refer to the Q&A 1669 and 1860 on the ECA website. In this example, you can see how the service life should be reported. Here, an ERC F has been used to describe the contributing activity for the environment for the use um, under Euclid section 354, widespread uses by professional workers. In this case, ERC 8F triggers a need for the service life use record. This means that you should create a service life use under Euclid section 356, service life, and link it in this case with the appropriate use in section 354 using subsequent service life name field, marked in yellow at the bottom of this screenshot. In conclusion, aforementioned changes in use description will impact all registrants since uses are reported in the dossiers of lead, member, and individual registrants. The downstream user sectors who have prepared use maps may also be impacted if use maps need updating. New rules will be visible in the Validation Assistant as of April 2023 Euclid release. However, format already exists, so the relevant inf information can already be reported. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time and attention. We are now reaching the end of the webinar, so let's conclude it with some take-home messages. The new and amended completeness check rules that were explained in this webinar will enter into force as of May 2023. Most of the rules will be automated rules and therefore visible in the validation assistant of the new Euclid version that will be released in the end of April. We encourage you to get familiar with the changes and revising your dossier if needed. For the areas of substance identification and the use description, the current Euclid format already enable you to provide all the information that will be mandatory as of May.
You can make use of our support material that you can find on the webinar page and on the Completeness Tech website. The registration manual will be updated in the April together with the new Euclid version, and you will find a list of up-to-date completeness check rules in the manual then. Remember that if you still need support with a particular topic that is not covered by the material, you can always get in touch with us using the contact form. As a reminder, our experts will reply to your questions in a Q&A panel, which will remain open until 1 o'clock Helsinki time. Send your questions to us by visiting the website slido.com and entering the code. Remember that if your question is not answered by the time the Q&A session ends, you can still send it to us using the contact form. Thank you for joining our webinar today. I hope that you have found it useful and wish you a very good day.